Hey guys, welcome to What the F*** is a Star Date Part 2, The Next Generation. So, I have to say, after making the last video, I wasn't planning on doing a Part 2, but then I started looking at some things and I owe you guys an apology. I said something that was blatantly false in my last video and well frankly i'm sorry i didn't mean to do that the last thing i want to do on this channel is say things that are just untrue so first let me replay the clip of the untrue comment let me say this i'm not referring to the well documented and well organized star date system that we see in the later iterations of star trek starting with star trek the next generation and continuing on through star trek deep space nine voyager enterprise and all the way through to the current era of trek why do i say that statement's untrue well simple upon closer examination it turns out that that statement is a pile of sh Oh, not the well-documented and well-organized part. That makes perfect sense. However, in comparison, the original series star dates make a whole lot more sense than the next generation era star dates, which we'll get into right now. So with the original star dates, we were able to figure out fairly easily that one star date equals one day, one 24 hour period. And therefore one year was 365 star dates. And so to calculate how many years old, for example, James D. Kirk was. I'm 34. I'm 34 years old. All we had to do was find out his established age at one point and then figure out how many star dates there were, divide by 365, etc., etc., do the math. Well, with the next generation, it seems a little different because each season of Star Trek The Next Generation is approximately 1,000 star dates. Captain's log, stardate 41153.7. Our destination is planet Deneb 4. Captain's log, stardate 42073.1. There has been an outbreak of an unclassified plasma plague in the Rotelli system. Captain's log, stardate 43125.8. We have entered a spectacular binary star system in the Cavis Alpha sector. First officer's log, stardate 44001.4. The board ship has resumed its course toward Earth. We are unable to pursue pending repairs to the Enterprise. Captain's log, stardate 45047.2. The Enterprise is en route to the uninhabited El Adrell system. Its location is near the territory occupied by an enigmatic race known as the Children of Tama. Captain's log, stardate 46001.3. Everyone who should be in the 19th century is safely there, and those who should be in the 24th are here. Captain's log, stardate 47025.4. We have returned to Federation space and are en route to Starbase 295. What's today's date? The date, stardate 47988. 47988. Captain, what's wrong? 47988. All Good Things wraps up on star date 47988.0. 6,834.3 star dates after encounter at Farpoint, which, if one star date equal one day, would be 18.72 years. In Star Trek The Next Generation, they never say five year mission, they say continuing mission for the Enterprise. So, them being out there for 18.72 years would be no big deal, except that it seems that one season does in fact equal one year in universe, because we have dialogue in the final episode to indicate that. Kill all the lawyers. Which was done. Leading to the rule, guilty until proven innocent. Of course. Bringing the innocent to trial would be unfair. <laughs> the last time that I stood here was seven years ago. Seven years ago? How little do you mortals understand time? Must you be so linear, Jean-Luc? So, it seems patently obvious that at least in the next generation era, one year equals 1,000 star dates, which means that about 2.74 star dates equals one 24 hour day. And we can further extrapolate that while yes, we're approximating a little bit as to not get too crazy with the decimal points here, that one star date 
is now approximately 8.75 hours. Okay, I'm okay with that. It's a little weird, but fine. And look, I know I'm a little older than most of my subscribers on YouTube. So yeah, I'm more of an original series guy. And I know that most of my friends that are next generation era fans tell me about how things in the next generation era are more carefully thought out than the original series. And star dates were just kind of slapped together in the original series. But in next generation, it was a more carefully thought out process. And that's why you can see exactly Exactly what season and episode order just based on the star date and it just makes a whole lot more sense okay so the next question should be obvious at what point did the star date change from a 24-hour day to approximately eight hours and 45 minutes and is there any way to glean this from existing canon now before I attempt to answer this and I am going to attempt to answer it I do want to say this. Uh, for people that want to say that this is all part of Gene Roddenberry's grand vision or something that Gene Roddenberry may have intended or whatever, for just a moment, forget about Gene Roddenberry's intentions because Gene Roddenberry had a very, very nasty habit. And that habit was he liked to canonize and decanonize things on a whim. Why did he do this? Because sometimes he just wanted to do something that was blatantly contradictory to something he had done before. This was no secret among the people who had produced and worked on Star Trek. You can look at the writings of Paula Block, of Richard Arnold, and many others who had worked behind the scenes on Star Trek to know that Gene Roddenberry did not have some gold standard to canon, and in fact, it was just a point by point, well, if I want to write something now that contradicts something that happened before, then the something that happened before is no longer canon as far as he's concerned. The problem is, is that Gene Roddenberry never saw Star Trek itself as an institution like we, the fans, do. Consider for just a moment this quote from Richard Arnold from 1991, who worked directly for and with Gene Roddenberry, and was asked specifically what is and is not canon. Quote, but generally, canon is the original series, not really the animated, the first movie to a certain extent, the rest of the films in certain aspects, but not in all. I know that is very difficult to understand. It is literally point by point. I sometimes do not know how he's going to answer, he being Gene Roddenberry, when I go into his office. I really do not always know. And I know it better than probably anybody what it is that Gene likes and doesn't. As to why did the star dates change? Well, because they felt like changing it. Why is it that warp 10 is now the speed limit of the universe when in the original series they went way faster than warp 10? Because they felt like there needed to be a speed limit. It doesn't matter that it contradicted the past. They simply retcon the past to no longer exist. It's a form of doublespeak. It's just since it's in a fictional universe, we tend to accept it a little more readily. And we as fans then try to come up with what we refer to as headcanon to try to explain how it happened within the universe in order to make the universe continue to work. The good news is, at least with star dates, I think that there is a good viable reason for the switch and that reason is there wasn't a switch i came to this conclusion when looking for the actual date that they might have switched it the first place i looked was to try and find something that bridges the gap between the original series and star trek the next generation the only thing i knew of directly was the appearance of Admiral Leonard McCoy in the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, in which we do have a star date and McCoy's A. Captain's log, star date 41153.7. What's so damn troublesome about not having died? How old do you think I am anyway? 137 years, Admiral, according to Starfleet records. I figured based on this, let's go back to the last TOS star date and see how far off is it to try and figure out about when the calendar must have changed. Captain's log, star date 9529.1. This is the final cruise of the Starship Enterprise under my command. 
McCoy's age is never explicitly stated in the original series or in the first six, six Star Trek films. However, we can simply use basic math to figure out how old McCoy should be at this point. All we have to do is look at the 137 years old that McCoy was on Stardate 41153.7, and then figure out the difference in number of star dates to Stardate 9529.1, divide that by 365, and we should have the number of years, and we come up with 51 years old at the time of the Undiscovered Country. Now, I'm sure many of you are thinking that, well, McCoy seems obviously a bit older than 51, but the interesting thing is that using the original series star dates, we already figured out that Kirk was only 50 at the time of the Und Undiscovered Country, which means that McCoy is actually older than Kirk, which would be about right. It's just that they both seem a little younger than maybe they should be. Now, you could probably come up with a reasonable explanation, like, for example, among the many diseases and various radiations and stuff they were exposed to, perhaps they show signs of aging a little faster than what the norm would be. But what really grabbed me here was the simple fact that the star dates themselves seem very consistent from the original series to the next generation era, with the exception of the length of a year. Why did that seem to change? And I'm pretty sure that the year must have changed at this point, because while you might think that it's a little bit of a stretch to say that Dr. McCoy is 51, I'd say it's quite a stretch to suggest that he's 106 at the time of the undiscovered country, which is what his age would be if it was 1,000 star dates per year. All that being said, we can patently reject the 1,000 day year out of hand simply because we know that it was more than 31 years in between the time of Dr. McCoy and the next generation era. How do we know this for certain? Because of this. Hi. So we know with 100% certainty that 78 years had passed from the launch of the Enterprise B to the time of Star Trek Generations, the destruction of the Enterprise D. Captain's log, Stardate 48632.4. Dr. Crusher has informed me that Data's emotion chip has been fused into his neural net and cannot be removed. Okay, so this is where things start to get really interesting. Based on Picard's log entry from the movie Generations and Kirk's log entry from the end of the Undiscovered Country, we can determine that the movie Generations takes place 107 years after Undiscovered Country. That's assuming the TOS era star dates. But then that would mean, in order to make it so that Generations takes place 78 years after the launch of the Enterprise B, Kirk and his crew would have had to have been retired for 29 years prior to the launch of the Enterprise B. So is there anything in canon we can use to corroborate almost three decades of no Enterprise? This is the first Starship Enterprise in 30 years without James T. Kirk in command. How do you feel about that, sir? Oh, just fine. I'm glad to be here to send her on her way. And what if Now, the first time I heard this reporter annoying Captain Kirk with this line, I just assumed she meant that, well, Kirk had served as captain of the Enterprise for 30 years, and now there's an Enterprise without Kirk in command. But then, after thinking about it, well... Kirk wasn't in command of the Enterprise for 30 years. After all, after the five-year mission, he took a position as chief of Starfleet operations. Decker was actually in command of the Enterprise 
up until the V'ger incident, at least during the refit time. And then Spock was in command of the Enterprise for at least some time up until the point of Star Trek II when Kirk assumed command in order to deal with Khan. It wasn't until the commission of the Enterprise A that Kirk was a full-time starship captain once again. And while we don't know exactly how long Kirk served in Starfleet after the Undiscovered Country, if at all, we do know that the Enterprise was about to be decommissioned. We're to put back to space dock immediately to be decommissioned. If I were human, I believe my response would be go to hell. Which means that his tenure as captain of the Enterprise was over. Which means what she must have meant is that there was a 30 year gap in which there was no Starship Enterprise with Kirk in command. This is the first Starship Enterprise in 30 years without James T. Kirk in command. How do you feel about that, sir? So thanks to the power of math. This is the power of math, people! Come on! You are correct, MC. What we have learned so far is that the timelines of the original series and Star Trek The Next Generation do indeed line up fine if we're using the original series star dates. Not only that, but the apparent problem of Kirk only being 50 years old at the time of the Undiscovered Country and hence his retirement from Starfleet isn't really so much a problem if we consider that when we see him 30 years later, He's 80 years old in the undiscovered country. You might think, well, wait a minute. Isn't 50 awfully young to be retiring? Not from the military. On average, enlisted personnel in the military retire at the age of 41. And officers at high rank, which is where Kirk would be, are required to retire after 30 years. So if Kirk received his commission somewhere around the age of 20, he would actually be required to retire at age 50. But what about the next generation? Is there any way to corroborate any of this using only Star Trek The Next Generation? Well, strangely enough, yes, there is. Now, unfortunately, in Star Trek The Next Generation, I couldn't find something quite as easy and obvious to use like Sulu's time clock. However, I did find a couple of episodes where we can use various captain's logs and timestamps to try and figure out how much time has actually elapsed and do a little bit of math to figure out, well, are the star dates being accurate or not? This is the power of math, people! Let's look at the also appropriately named episode, Time Squared. Captain's log, star date 42679.2. While en route to the Endicor system, we have encountered a Federation shuttlecraft, which seems to have appeared out of nowhere. Hey, Data. Hey, look at the star date. 42679.5. So in the episode Times Squared, they find a shuttlecraft apparently from the future. And when Geordi looks at the chronometer on the shuttlecraft, they find that it has a star date that is three-tenths ahead of the time that was in the opening captain's log from this episode. So, how much time is three-tenths of one star date? Well, guess what we get to use? That's right. This is the power of math, people! Man, I wish they hadn't done that. Anyway, if we are to use the TNG concept of 1,000 star dates divided by 365-day year, where one star date equals 8.75 hours, three ticks on the good old star date clock, three tenths of a star date as we're seeing here, would be 2.625 hours or roughly two hours and 40 minutes, which means that assuming that they grabbed the shuttle and hooked up the shuttle to power immediately upon Picard giving his log at the beginning of the episode, the shuttle's chronometer can be no more than two hours and 40 minutes ahead of the chronometer on the Enterprise. However, keep in mind that they do have to do a couple of things to hook the shuttle up, so some time has to pass. That's just a fact. That being said, if we're talking about the TOS era, then three ticks on the start date clock would actually be closer to 7.2 hours or about 7 hours and 12 minutes or so. And so that means that if the time frame 
is somewhere in between that two hours and 40 minutes and seven hours and 12 minutes, then we pretty much confirm the TOS time. If it's more than seven hours, well, then it's something else. And if it's less than two hours and 40 minutes, then we've confirmed the TNG time. So let's take a look at what Jordy says next. Captain. Go ahead. Captain, we've been able to reactivate the shuttle and the onboard clock indicates that the shuttle is six hours in front of us so there you have it picard enters his initial log at stardate 42679.2 they detect a shuttle they bring the shuttle into the ship they find out the mysterious occupant of the shuttle data and geordi spend a little bit of time hooking up the power to the shuttle adapting the power for the shuttle and then, after about an hour and 12 minutes of work, Geordi discovers that the shuttle's clock is six hours ahead. Sounds pretty cut and dry to me. However, while that does solve the one star day equals one day issue, that doesn't quite resolve why is it then that one year seems to equal 1,000 days. And then it dawned on me. We're all assuming that they're using an Earth calendar. Even though on Earth, there are in fact multiple calendars in active use. While the Western world pretty much takes for granted that the current year as of this writing is 2023, that is a specifically Western and specifically Christian concept. After all, the 2023 in our calendar represents the year of our Lord, 2023. While there is an updated version to say that rather than the year of our Lord, that the 2023 should be in the common era, the common era would still be in the year of our Lord. So it's still based on the birth of Christ. However, if I was going by the Islamic calendar, the current year will be 1444. According to the Chinese calendar, the year is 4719. In the Hebrew calendar, the current year is 5784. So the fact that we have multiple calendars in use just on Earth, why the heck would we think there's only one calendar in use in space? Well, obviously an organization as vast as the Federation would need to standardize its dating system or it would be impossible to set a meeting place and time for any two people. So they came up with a system known as Stardates. Stardates uses a 1,000-day system for a year and uses a 24-hour day cycle, most likely because most humanoid species, and it does seem that the majority of Federation species are humanoid, require something near a 24-hour day-night cycle. Based on that, when we hear the year being 1,000 days long, it's not an Earth year, it's a star year. And as you might have imagined, I can find a couple of clips in the original series to corroborate this. On Earth today, it's Thanksgiving. If the crew has to eat synthetic meatloaf, I wanted to look like turkey. In the episode Charlie X, while Kirk gets a captain's log saying the star date is 1533.6, he also tells the chef that on Earth, it's Thanksgiving, and so he wants the synthetic meatloaf to look like turkey. Because... Kirk is just a nice guy. Obviously, there's nothing about Stardate 1533.6 to indicate the month of November or the idea that it is a special holiday of any kind. And so it would seem obvious that they are using a different calendar aboard ship than they are back home on Earth or there wouldn't be a Thanksgiving. So that teaches us two very important things. One, that they are indeed using a very different calendar than the Gregorian calendar that we are used to today. And two, that back home on Earth, they are in fact still using the Gregorian calendar or something like it, if they are still measuring days in the traditional manner. Isn't it unusual for a Balkan to retire at your age? After all, you're only 102. 102.437 precisely, Doctor. Measure it in your years. Now here we have a couple of things that's interesting too. One, McCoy makes the mistake of actually calling out Sarek's age based on human age. 
saying that he's 102 years old. Obviously, that 102 years old is based on Earth years. And so, Sarek, being a Vulcan and therefore a dick, decides to take it to the next level and give him the more precise measurement and also point out to him that he is converting it to their units of measurement for him. Now, unfortunately, we don't find out exactly how many Vulcan years that would be. It's entirely possible that Sarek would be... 45 or 550. We have no idea because we don't know how long a Vulcan year is. But what we do know is that they're not talking about star dates. So here's the best part of all this is that if we take this calendar system to where the Universal Federation calendar is a 1000 day calendar with a 24 hour day. However, Humans still use something like a Gregorian calendar. Vulcans use whatever calendar they choose to use, and every other species can use whatever they want locally. Then, Kirk's five-year mission did indeed take five years. Five star years, five standard Federation years. However, those five years equated to 12 years of Earth time, because it's a different calendar. Likewise, when Picard was telling Q that it was seven years ago that he last stood in front of him, he was referring to seven star years. And what's interesting is that if you pay attention to the scene, Q then immediately gets indignant at Picard, not because he finds Picard annoying, but because he gets tired of the way the humans deal with measuring time. The last time that I stood here, was seven years ago. Seven years ago? How little do you mortals understand time? Must you be so linear, Jean-Luc? So there you have it. Star dates completely solved. One synchronous system that has lasted from the original series all the way through Next Generation, 1,000 days per year, one star date per 24-hour day. The star date calendar is independent of the Gregorian calendar or any other measurement of time. It all just makes sense now. Yep, not a single star date out of order. Everything just makes sense and all fits together perfectly. First officer's log, star date 1207.3. Personal log, star date 1201.7. Okay, so maybe season two of Discovery ended five days before season one started? Captain's Log, Stardate 2344.2. Captain's Log, Stardate 2712.4. Ship's log, star date 2124.5. And maybe season two of Strange New Worlds took place midway through season one of the original series? What is the current star date? Star date? 223304. Acting Captain's log, star date 78186.03. Do you mind? Hello. Hello. I love pretend. Hello. What is this?